Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, all the way from the US, from MIT, is a naive optimist, Andy, who wants to talk about DNA, knows all about it, and even knows a whole sentence of German that he wanted to share with us. So, Andy, take the stage Thanks. and make it a great show. Thanks. Uh, can I have a beer, Abend, bitte? Can I have a beer, Abend, bitte? Make that too. Can I have a beer, Abend, bitte? <laughs> No, really, I would like a beer, please. Um, so, if you look around the room, everything in this room is hackable, uh, except for the living stuff. You know, the wood, the air has been conditioned, uh, the building that we're in, but the living things aren't readily hackable. And so, uh, what I'd like to bring you up to speed on is the current state of the art in engineering uh, biology and see where that goes. My hope is that uh, I'll get answers to two questions and also be able to leave the room. So the two questions I have, uh, will there be biological hackers? Uh, I think the answer is yes, if they're not already. And the second question is, will there be a community around biological hacking? And I'll come back to these at the end. So uh, I have a deep time view on this. Uh, if you go back to the 1950s, World War II, and soon thereafter, people were building computers for things that really weren't that interesting, like designing hydrogen bombs and computing the trajectories of munitions. Uh, only 25 years later, people became so fed up with limited access to computers that they built objects like this. And now we have objects that are not so different, but more impressive. Um, so biotechnology in its modern form is about 30 years old more or less today. And the question is, what are sort of the transitions we're going through? To introduce you to what's going on, I want to talk about a, a, a virus, a biological virus to start. And then from this, I'll get to a more open-ended programming framework for engineering genetic material. Uh, so if you haven't seen a biological virus, this is a virus that infects not people, it's a virus that infects bacteria. There's an electron micrograph on the left, and then a schematic diagram of the particle, the virus in the middle, and then an action shot on the right. This is a, 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 a physical object. It's about 100 nanometers in scale. And um, uh, what it does is it carries some DNA around. The DNA encodes a program that causes bacteria to make more copies of itself. Rather than talk about this, I'll just show you a movie of one of these things. These are bacteria growing under the microscope. And as they're growing and divided, they've all been infected with a virus. And because the virus is so small, you can't see it. Uh, and then eventually, the cells are destroyed each time the cell pops and is destroyed, that releases several hundred copies of the virus to repeat the infection process. So the key features of biological technology in this virus is one example, is that it's a self-assembling technology, right? I can take the bits and pieces and throw them in a soup and they make stuff. You know, I don't have to solder it together. That's pretty impressive. It operates on the nanoscale. So it's a nanotechnology, really? You don't have to read Eric Drexler and have a bunch of fantasies. You actually have a nanotechnology. It's called biology. Uh, it's a reproducing machine. So this is an object that can copy itself physically. And you can program it. You can program it via the genetic material, via DNA. So to an engineer, this is an amazing technology platform. The, the sad state of affairs is we're really bad at, at doing the engineering of it. So just to motivate this example from, from some external perspectives. Uh, this is a world map showing chlorophyll distribution in the ocean. The chlorophyll in the ocean is carried by bacteria. The bacteria are destroyed by these viruses. In some places, 40% of the bacteria in the ocean are destroyed every day by bacterial viruses. And this might sound bad, but it's actually pretty important because it helps the bacteria evolve. It also helps genes transfer, apparently, from one bacteria to the next. So they're viruses that actually carry photosynthetic genes with them as they go from one bacteria to the next. There's also technology you can make. So here's a project uh, out of MIT where folks are, are assembling viruses into nanoscale materials um, in the middle using uh, gold nanowires, cobalt, or um, gallium nitride uh, nanowires. So there's now some new battery technology being built using biology to put atoms of metals basically exactly where you want to. So biology is important, obviously, to us in the living world, uh, and it's also an important technology. So if you wanted to begin to think about how to reverse engineer these systems, what you could do is you could go online to a website called PubMed, 
and you could type in bacteriophage, bacteria viruses, and you could get uh, the DNA sequence for one of these viruses. Here it is. This is uh, 30, 39,937 base pairs of DNA. DNA is A, T, C, or G, just a string of, of genetic material. And so you could read this and try and figure it out, right? This would be like looking at, uh, um, I guess, machine language and trying to reverse engineer what the system is doing, keeping in mind that this is a self-assembling, nanoscale, reproducing machine, right, that has been evolved over some period of time we don't know. It's hard to find documentation uh, within this. <laughs> So, um, you know, if you're excited about reverse engineering, probably the most exciting reverse engineering I know of is reverse engineering natural evolved biological objects. It's just an incredible problem. And the people who do it are called geneticists. And so if you're a reverse engineering hacker, you could go get a very high paying job in genetics. Um, so here's a different depiction of that same information. Instead of the machine language of the cell, it's one level up at a functional level of, of depiction. These boxes, are things called genes. Genes encode different molecular functions. So um, gene number five, the red gene, that's a gene that encodes a protein called a DNA polymerase. It's just a Xerox copier for DNA. So when the phage needs to copy its own DNA, it makes this protein, it uh, makes more of that. Um, the, all the blue genes, they make the particle, the shell of the, of the, the virus itself and so on. And then you've got a whole bunch of control elements. So this is the architecture of a virus that we found uh, in nature. It was isolated 60 years ago. You could s mix up the program, right? And the short and the long story is, you know, I have no idea what this new program will do, even though it has all the same basic genetic functions. Don't know what it's going to do. Uh, so to try and address problems like this, we use computers. Here's a computer simulation of virus infection where we're tracking molecules running along the DNA and reading out the DNA and making proteins and blah, blah, blah. Um, this is open source software. You can go online and find it and run it and simulate at the molecular level any genetic program that you want. The problem with these genetic simulators is that they're not very good, meaning if I were to make a prediction using one of these simulators and then go change my real genetic program, the behavior of my changed program won't usually be what I expect. It'll be something else. So I've spent a lot of time, and, and apologize, I'm drilling really far down into details here, and I want to do that up front so that I can motivate why I think it's really interesting to hack biology. I've spent a lot of time thinking about why biology is very hard to interact with as an engineer. And so here are the three reasons I've come up with. Here's, here's the list of all the functions on this one virus genome we're looking at. And the ones that are highlighted in this color, those are the ones for which nobody's figured out what the function is. Right? Completely unknown. It's been studied for 60 years, about 40% of the parts, right? 40% of the functions, we don't know what they do. So it'd be like lifting up the hood of your car or taking apart your computer and you're like, what the heck's that? Four out of 10 times. But with the computer or the car, you get to go talk to the engineer, maybe, right? Uh, in this case, you don't have anybody to go talk to. If you go down and look at one lower level, and this will be as detailed as I get, uh, this is the specific genetic sequence uh, on part of the virus's DNA. So the letters here are the DNA sequence. This number, that, re that, that refers to one function, one biochemical function, number 2.8. And then number three is a, is a separate biochemical function. So it's like having an if statement and uh, an else if. And somehow the, the machine language that they're using to encode the functions actually overlap in the same piece of genetic material. So this sequence comes in and stops at this TAA. And then this next one, this three, starts up at this ATG. I have no idea what this does. If it's important, if it's some sort of data compression, right, so that the DNA doesn't have to be as long as it might be otherwise, or if there's some sort of coupling as this DNA is read out, it controls whether or not this DNA is read out. It also means that if I have an idea like, I want to get rid of three or I want to make more three, I can't do that without at least mucking up 2.8. I don't have independence of manipulation. So if I'm trying to reverse engineer natural biological systems, I've got situations where for basically everything we're studying, about 40 to 50% of the components, nobody has a clue what they do. And then if you look at the source code or the machine language, uh, it hasn't been optimized by evolution to be easy to understand or interact with. 
Now here's a schematic of an electronic circuit um, that you might have seen. This is a circuit that takes the square root of an input voltage. It wasn't designed by a human being, it was designed by a, a piece of software that evolves electronic circuits by John Koza out at Stanford. Um, so the questions that come, I took this schematic to uh, Jerry Sussman, who's an electrical engineering professor at MIT, because I was very excited about this. I said, Jerry, you know, how does this thing work? Explain it to me. And um, the first thing he said, because he has very good eyesight, um, he goes, that's a really crappy printout, right? <laughs> and then the next thing he said, after thinking about it for 30 seconds, he goes, where did you get this? I said, well, this guy Koza out at Stanford evolved it. And he goes, I go, I'm, but I'm really excited. Could you explain to me how it works? Because if I could understand how these evolved electronic circuits work, then that might help me reverse engineer evolved genetic circuits, right? And uh, he goes, you know, um, that's a really stupid thing to ask me to do. You're asking me to waste my time. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, well, this thing hasn't been designed for it to be easy for me to understand. So why would you ask me to try and figure it out and explain it to you? Um, So what if uh, nature is like that? What if the evolved genetic systems that we're trying to reverse engineer are like it? Maybe we could design and build new genomes that have different uh, low-level architecture that support greater uh, reuse and understandability. So if you take this sequence here that has these overlapping elements, let's just make a new engineered sequence where we take three and we put it over here. We take the control sequence for three, we put it here. We make some edits to 2.8 so it has nothing to do with three anymore. We add some new sequences of DNA in the middle to insulate and separate the functions out and add control hooks and so on. Um, and so we did that. And so here's the, uh, you know, apologies, there's a lot of stuff here. Here's that 40,000 base pair piece of DNA and then uh, we broke it down into different sections and we redesigned all the sections to make it more understandable to us. Uh, so for example, the sequence that we were just looking at, 2.8 and 3, is depicted right here and you can see we pulled them apart. And then we did that for everything across the whole genome, making hundreds of changes at the same time. And then we built that piece of DNA and we put it back into cells to see what it would do. Um, and the big uh, result for us, um, was that after making about 600 changes at once, the program was still viable. So on the left, what you're looking at is a Petri dish. It's a 10 centimeter plastic dish. It's filled with jello. And uh, this is the natural virus. This opaque white background is, is bacteria that are scattering light. And then the uh, circle here, the dark circle, is where the virus is growing and replicating and propagating. So you can think of it this way, if you're up in a satellite or the space station and you look down at a forest and you've parachuted a, a, a lumberjack into the forest and every time the lumberjack cuts a tree down, you get 10 more lumberjacks and they keep cutting down trees. <laughs> that's, what, that's what these circles are. So depending on how good your lumberjacks are or how good your virus is, that will define the size of the circle, how quickly it grows. And you can see the natural virus is really, really good at clearing out holes in bacterial forests, uh, whereas our engineered virus makes much smaller holes. So it's not as good, it's not as fit. It doesn't grow as fast. It's about 40% uh, lower fitness. So the question to us was, is this a good trade-off? Are we willing to get up 40, give up 40% reproductive fitness for much, much more uh, understandability? In the wild, this thing would never survive, but in our, in our laboratory, uh, this has uh, a lot of features that we like. You can read about this in a paper. We, we used the word refactoring in the paper, stealing from computer science, because we thought we were rewriting a code to make it easier to understand. In this case, it was a genetic program. So, so that was a couple years ago. Um, and uh, having had this one experience, it became more interesting to think about, well, let's not start with the things that already exist. Let's develop generic frameworks for programming any new genetic system we want, building on the bits and pieces that might exist, but assembling them anew. So as a toy problem, for example, if you, know, you have these bacteria that live in your gut, and sometimes they make odors which aren't so pleasant. Um, and so what if you could reprogram E. coli to smell like mint or wintergreen while the E. coli are growing, and then as bananas, well, they're not growing. B bacteria, they grow and then they rest and, and so on. Um, I'm in the biological engineering department at MIT, and if that department was really up to speed, right, of course we could do stuff like this. 
right? Because bananas smell like bananas and mint smells like mint. So all we need to do is port that over into bacteria and then we'll have uh, eau de coli. Um, the questions that come up are what language should I use? Uh, what's the cost, the time, or the probability of success? Great. Am I going too fast or too slow, or is this okay? Thank you. So uh, I'll get to the answer to that question, and we've, we've, we've done that project. Um, but, but to s give you a sense of where the world is today, I want to show you maybe about 10 postcards from not from MIT, but from all over the world, just so you can see what people are doing with genetic engineering. So this is a project from Mitsubishi in Japan, where they took the genome of one organism and they moved it into the genome of a second organism, the blue and the red, to make a composite genome. This is a hack. It took them seven years to do this. And the resulting organism doesn't work very well, but it, it is viable. Now, the, the size of the genome that they have is 7.7 .7, uh, million base pairs of DNA. So just about 10 million base pairs of DNA. To put that in context, baker's yeast or brewer's yeast, I still haven't gotten my beer yet. Um, <laughs> uh, that's about 12 million base pairs of DNA. So this is a genetic engineering operation on the scale of, of baker's yeast. So you can begin to think about engineering something as big and as significant and as important as, uh, as baker's and brewer's yeast. Here's a project from France. This one really uh, uh, impressed me. Um, the, human, the human genome was sequenced in 2000, our own DNA. And people have now, you can get that sequence on your computer and you can study it, right? So if you want to reverse engineer stuff, there's a nice thing to reverse engineer, you. Um, and uh, these folks in France found that there was uh, basically genetic fossils, pieces of DNA that appeared to have been inserted in our own genome um, about five million years ago, whatever our ancestors were five million years ago. And these pieces of DNA stopped working. They came from what looks to be a virus. And then they all sort of evolved independently, one from the next. They fell apart in different ways. And so today we have about 20 or 30, I can't remember the exact number, copies of this ancient virus lying dormant in our own genome. What they did is they analyzed the 20 different broken copies and because they were each broken in different spots, they could infer what the ancestral virus was five million years ago. So they reconstructed that, um, and they put that back into tissue culture, meaning a controlled laboratory environment, and that produced a fully infectious human retrovirus. Uh, so it's like the movie Jurassic Park, but without needing to have the physical sample of the amber, if that makes sense, because the information's already inside you. I'll come back to this. Um, Here's a project out of San Francisco where there, has anybody, have, have folks here seen the movie, it's an old movie called Fantastic Voyage, where somebody's sick and so they need to shrink down a submarine and then the submarine goes into the body to fix stuff? Yeah. So the problem, that's a great idea, except the problem is we don't have shrinking rays. And I don't know, maybe there's shrinking rays in the next talk, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But we do have, it turns out, uh, little nanoscale programmable objects called bacteria. And if we could implement some sensors and logic and actuators, then maybe we could program them to go around and fix stuff up. And so that's what this project's doing, trying to get bacteria to specifically target tumors and destroy them. Here's a project out of, out of Pasadena, California, Caltech, where they're implementing logic gates out of pieces of RNA. So they have funny shapes, and they basically turn on or off in response to whatever signal you want. So it's like little molecular switches. Here's a project out of Princeton. Um, these are bacteria growing, and the movie blips a little bit. Basically, these bacteria are running a genetic ring oscillator inside them, a little primitive clock. And the clock is controlling a glowing protein. So when it's noon, the cells are glowing, and when it's 6 p.m. or 1800 or whatever, um, the cells are dark. Um, that was kind of old. I, I like the movie because it spells out sort of MIT, um, <laughs> which is an accident. Here's um, a metabolic engineering project. Metabolic engineering is let's reprogram me metabolism to make chemicals. And here a group at Berkeley is trying to make uh, artemisinic acid for treating malaria um, and grow, grow bacteria to make that instead of harvesting the chemical from wormwood trees. This is, this is the, the logical outgrowth of very early genetic engineering projects such as making insulin in bacteria for treating diabetes as opposed to getting it from pigs. 
Uh, here's a project, a uh, company out of, out of MIT where they're putting algae uh, in the smokestacks of power plants to capture the carbon dioxide in the presence of sunlight and remove the nitrogen compounds to clean up the gases coming out of power plants. The problems with this are probably not the biology, it's more the implementation of the engineering at scale, the reactors and the pipes and stuff like that. Here's a paper, I don't know where this is from, California, Santa Barbara apparently. Um, they added, an, uh, these researchers added a new photoreceptor into mice. So now mice apparently can see in three colors instead of two. Whatever that means uh, to a mouse. <laughs> Here's a project uh, out of uh, Texas in San Francisco. People took bacteria E. coli from the gut, which normally don't respond to light. They added a single photoreceptor. And now when you spread E. coli out on a surface, this is a 10 by 10 centimeter dish, they'll respond to light. Here they're using it to change color in response to light, so you can use this to take a picture. Um, that's Andy Ellington in the biochemistry department at Texas. Well, you know, there's a, there's a film that develops very slowly. It takes about four hours to take a picture. Um, but the cool thing is you get to grow the film and you have about um, 600 million bacteria per square inch. So it's almost gigapixel per square inch. Uh, in this case, you have a Petri dish, which we talked about before, and in the center, there's a signal diffusing. And the bacteria in the Petri dish have band detectors, genetic band detectors programmed into them. And so they differentiate and change colors uh, in space in response to the signal. So you can be in the program pattern formation in space. Here's a project out of Caltech where folks have taken DNA, Paul uh, Rothmund, and figured out how to program it to fold into any arbitrary two-dimensional structure. Uh, within the limits of the, the, the DNA molecule. So you go from squares to happy faces to the world map. And then there are things that we can't do, right? So here's a sponge, uh, I think from the Pacific, a basket sponge, Joanna Eisenberg's now, she's at Bell Labs, she's now at Harvard. And uh, this thing's about 10 centimeters long, and it's a glass uh, basket with very interesting mechanical properties that grows itself. Write down the genetic program that produces this. Don't know. And uh, here's another thing we can't do. This is from the architecture department at MIT. Um, they would like to grow houses, right? So gigantic gourds that grow and differentiate into a four bedroom, two bath house. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, room for biohacking in the future. Now, um, to contrast this with other engineering disciplines, here I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, civil engineering. Here's a project from around here, France, uh, where folks over a period of time constructed uh, this artifact, this viaduct, this bridge. And so the thing that's interesting as a, as a would-be engineer of biology is how come the civil engineers get to make stuff like this, yet all I get to do is, you know, sort of add a photoreceptor to E. coli. And so the way to think about this for me uh, is to look at how the civil engineers got to this point, because they started here thousands of years ago uh, at the beginning of the Stone Age when they recognized, uh, people recognized, we recognized that rocks are useful, right? You can build walls, but the rocks you find in nature are hard to work with because they're all different. And so let's start making regular rocks with standard interfaces so that it's easier to build stuff. And even though the basic building blocks become simpler, the artifacts we can make from them become more complicated like flying buttresses and so on. And so it's easier to make bridges and you name it. Now later on in the Stone Age, the Stone Age that we live in today, that we inherit, people have already become dissatisfied with rocks. And so we grind up the rocks and we make new synthetic rocks. This is called concrete or reinforced concrete. And that's how you get stuff like this. So the question is, what does the world look like as we begin to invest resources in taking this raw material, which we depend on and is beautiful and improbable and is us ourselves, and try and make it easier to engineer? so that stuff like this becomes uh, not just a dream, but an executable uh, genetic hack. Okay, so two more parts to the talk and then it'll wrap. So here are the three technologies that, thank you so much. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. See, I don't know any more German, so I can't, thank you. Uh, wait, danke, all right. Is that right? Okay, so, so here are the technologies that biotechnology is based on over the last 30 years. Recombinant DNA uh, lets you cut and paste 
pre-existing fragments of DNA. PCR lets you amplify up DNA. And sequencing lets you take a piece of DNA and read it out so you get, you get the letters. The new technologies that are being built out are automated construction, push the button, get the DNA from scratch, and abstraction and standardization, basically a, a, a set of languages that you'll see. So let me talk about each of these very quickly. Automatic construction. So in the left are um, four jars of chemicals. One is the chemical A, the next is T, the next is C, the next is G. These chemicals are derived from sugar cane. Um, you can buy these jars for $250 each. And you plug these jars into a machine called a DNA synthesizer. And then the DNA synthesizer takes information from a computer network and it prints DNA from scratch. So if you've seen Star Trek where they have the food replicators and they sort of, I would like a pumpkin spiced latte or something, and you push the button. <laughs> this, is, um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a matter compiler for genetic material. And what's actually frightening for me is I wish I could explain it better, but when I went online to find documentation for DNA synthesizers, it's actually easier to find documentation for how the food replicators in Star Trek work. <laughs> But nevertheless, what this is practically to think about it is a, um, a matter compiler for genetic material. And since the living world that we care about runs on genetic material, this is an important technology to be aware of. And what's very interesting is this technology is getting better very quickly. So on the, on the left of the plot, this is years and then stuff over time. Uh, it's, the left plot is features per chip on, mi on microprocessors. It's Moore's law for computing, a log scale. And then the middle plot is how much DNA we can sequence in a day, if you're just reading out DNA. So in 1990, nobody had sequenced a bacterial genome. In 1995, the first bacterial genome is sequenced. In 2000, five years later, the draft of the human being is, has been, we've been sequenced. So somehow in the 1990s, we go from not being able to sequence anything to being able to sequence people. That's not because the geneticists got 10 billion times smarter in 10 years. It's because the technology for reading out DNA got better. The last plot on the right is how much DNA you can write or compile in DNA synthesizers in a day, going from the information to the material. And that's lagging behind sequencing because our synthesizers aren't very good. You need to make something and then sequence it to find out where the mistakes were so you can fix your synthesizer. Um, but it's going up at least as quickly. And in this year, the, this is an old paper, 2003. In 2007, this is the year where a bacterial uh, genome is reported to have been constructed from scratch, where a uh, mitochondrial genome has been constructed from scratch, a chloroplast genome has been constructed from scratch. So I think this is our 1995 for, for synthesis, meaning in five years, I would be surprised if the construction of bacterial genomes and eukaryotic chromosomes like yeast isn't a routine process. It's hard to appreciate surfing along an exponential, even though we're all familiar with it from computing. When you see it playing out in biology, it's somewhat astonishing. So for example, to come back to this paper where we engineered a 12,000 base pair fragment of DNA, here's the instructions for how we did it. You could find this freely available online under Creative Commons license. So you can read our instructions. To build the first section, we clone parts 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24 into PSP 104. That's the best technician in my lab working for three and a half months to execute that one sentence. Um, <laughs> we cloned part 11 into PSP 2K3. We cloned each part with its part specific fracking restriction sites. Blah, 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 blah. You could read the rest. So this paragraph is three and a half years of, of work to make a 12,000 base pair fragment of DNA. This is a project that ran from 2003 to 2004. Um, today, this paragraph gets replaced with the sentence where you ship the sequence information over the, the web and somebody builds it for you. If you type in, you start looking for that online, you'll find lots of companies. Okay, I'll move quickly. Um, most genetic engineering takes place at this level, at the level of machine language. All right, so TAATA, CGA, CTC, ACTATA, GGGA, GA. 23 base pair sequence of DNA, which you'll remember is the consensus promoter for the T7 RNA polymerase, an enzyme that turns on transcription of... Um, now, I happen to remember this one sequence because it was my computer password uh, for a while. <laughs> but the problem is there are a lot of sequences like this to memorize, and if one were to program DNA at this level, it would be like only programming in machine language, I guess, if I'm using the right analogy. 
And so what we want to do is implement uh, what a computer scientist would recognize as an abstraction hierarchy supporting programming and DNA. So we'll just make this up and see how it goes. Parts are basic biological stuff, and we'll hide the DNA, and we'll give it a number, and we'll give it some functional information so you could use it without having to know all the biology. And then we'll build devices out of parts. These are just a bunch of numbers. This, these four parts come together to make an inverter or a not gate, Boolean logic. Um, this turns out to be a bad design because the input and output signals aren't the same. So we reorganize the black box and we make a common signal carrier inverter and blah, 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 blah. Then you put the inverters together to make a ring oscillator and we're bootstrapping up an abstraction hierarchy. If that didn't make any sense, you can go to uh, the web and get this comic strip which explains how to implement abstraction for genetic engineering. Okay. So as a result, we now have the beginnings of an abstraction hierarchy. It's incredibly primitive, uh, but practically what it lets you do is somebody gets to become a systems engineer, the other person at the bottom becomes an expert DNA constructor. The person at the top doesn't need to know that DNA is made up of four bases, but you still get to engineer a biological system. Uh, in doing all of this, we're stealing lessons from all other forms of engineering. So mechanical engineering from the 1860s, where in the U.S., thank God, we finally got standardization of screw threads, 60 degree angles squared off at the top, so that things snap together and work when you put them together, so long as you don't mess up the English metric stuff. Um, we started a registry of standard biological parts. These are open source genetic objects, uh, parts.mit.edu. Uh, there are about 2,000 different parts in the catalog right now. They stink. They're not very well characterized. They haven't been refined to support reliable functional composition, but they will snap together, and you can see what happens. Uh, here's our best part. Uh, we've got a data sheet, for example. This is a receiver, a genetic receiver. You put this in a cell, and the cell stands ready to respond to a small modified sugar or a signal that comes in from the environment. And so uh, this is the, the, the architecture of this data sheet is lifted from the TTL data book from Texas Instruments. If you're familiar with that, you got the transfer function, the response time, the specificity of the receiver to different input signals. Uh, the one thing that's different is the bottom right plot, which is the evolutionary stability of this device. How quickly will it mutate as you go from one generation to the next? Um, yeah. <laughs> What's the license and so on? So. Um, one of my projects for now is starting a factory that makes lots of parts and puts them in the public domain. Uh, so it's a lot of work to do that. And so to, to sort of transition to the last part of the talk, as we've been implementing uh, these very naive and primitive lessons from other forms of engineering in support of genetic engineering, what we're finding is uh, people like to make stuff. Uh, so here are students going back to 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. These are students who participate in something called iGEM. iGEM is the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, which is a worldwide genetic engineering competition for undergraduates, uh, in which teams of students from around the world compete over the summer to design and build a genetic engineered machine of their choosing, so long as it's a constructive thing. Um, and so here's the world map of the teams from... from uh, 2006. And you'll see we didn't have a lot of teams from China, so then we went out to, to China and we got five schools from China to come in. And so here are the students from this year. Um, and so, for example, the team from Melbourne, Australia showed up with some new bio brick parts. Uh, they wanted to change how bacteria float, give you that option. If you're working on some project, I don't know what, uh, but you want bacteria to float or sink or remain neutral, well, here's the part for you. Uh, this piece of DNA encodes a little protein balloon that is somehow gas impermeable, and the protein balloon boots up inside cells, and depending on the number of balloons that you boot up, you'll change the buoyancy of the cells, right? I didn't know anything about this biology. They showed up, they refined it, they made it compatible with what else we've got, so you're free to use it. Um, there are probably tens of thousands of other things like this that we need, and if you wanted to help make some of those, that would be terrific. Um, so this, this question from before, reprogram E. coli to smell nice, was one of the student projects. Um, here's the team that did it. They're five teenagers, and um, in a period of four months, they implemented a 24-component system. Uh, and this looks, you know, maybe a little bit detailed, but note that there's no DNA sequence on this system diagram, right? There's things like BSGD, which is a banana smell generating device, right? <laughs> Thank you.
And so they were able to um, add in a bunch of parts into E. coli, remove some of the components that make E. coli smell less than good, and um, try it out. So they tried it out at the, we have a jamboree at the end of the competition where everybody shows up, and their results of their smell test are shown here. They have the, the natural bacteria, which almost 90% of the people agree is stinky, and then the mint is kind of hard to smell, and then the bananas is pretty powerful. Okay, so you know this is sort of where <laughs> this is sort of where we are, right? This is this is the high water mark of, of genetic hacking. So let me let me end uh, in the last five minutes with some questions and and a briefing on what you might call social issues or we we call issues of human practice. I probably spend. 60 to 80 percent of my time on this the questions in this slide as opposed to the stuff in the lab so you know yes or no um, biosafety level four is is sort of hemorrhagic fevers for which there's no cure and they're transmitted as, as uh, droplets um, so should there be top secret labs working on these things um, will biohackers be good or bad is garage biotech inevitable should the parts be patented or freely available should genetic engineers sign their work Lots of questions that come up around safety and security and, and what have you. And uh, you know, what surprised me is how exciting uh, the technology of biology is to people in the, in the hacker community. So here's Make Magazine showing you how to make a gel electrophoresis system for separating DNA out of Legos and a nine volt battery daisy chain. Um, here's a, a thermocycler for doing polymerase chain reaction to amplify up DNA. Uh, here's a uh, clean box for working on colonial propagation of spores uh, by, by reverse, just decompiling and reassembling a, an air filter. Um, pretty sophisticated stuff. And then, of course, um, there's an impressive article, a genuinely impressive article in 2600 from a number of years ago that I was accused of writing, but I didn't, um, unfortunately. I mean, it's really well written. Uh, and this is my first I experience with the, this, this uh, hacker community, so DISA, Unix Security Reality, Living Without a Social Security Number, Whom Do You Trust? Hacking the Genome, written by Professor L anonymously, uh, beautiful writing, teaches you how to clone a luciferase gene that makes light into E. coli, and then if you wanted to do this with your dog, uh, go take a course. Um, but the motivation spot on. Biotechnology is so unbelievably cool, and the industries that we've got thus far are not realizing the potential of the, the material. Uh, let's get more people doing it. So about 30 years ago, when recombinant DNA technology was invented, people freaked out. Simplest way to say it. So in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I'm from, uh, using recombinant DNA technology was outlawed by the city. Not allowed to do it. And in response to that, the scientific community had a big conversation about how to practice recombinant DNA technology sa safely. Um, there's a famous meeting covered by Rolling Stone magazine in Asilomar, California in 1975. And basically what they figured out how to do, and I'll get to this in a second, is uh, move the, the new technologies of recombinant DNA into the existing recommendations for biological safety. Now, the same time that this was happening, other people, this is the Subway newspaper from Boston in 1977, 30 years ago, uh, where there's uh, instructions for how to clone a toxin gene in your kitchen. Now, um, what's interesting to me is I don't have any reports of this actually happening. And I don't know it's because nobody really wanted to do this, or people tried to do it and they killed themselves. And so there was a strong <laughs> negative selection against hacking uh, stupid stuff. So there's biosafety levels and whatnot that you can learn about. There's different you know, dangers to the researcher, the environment, or the public that you want to be aware of if you're thinking about this. In the US, if we get money from the government, the National Institutes of Health at MIT, and I'm doing DNA engineering, I have to go through a, a CAB, the Committee on the Assessment of Biohazards, which includes members of the public, and they review the work before it gets done. There's problems with this system, but there's frameworks like this that I get to inherit 30 years later. This project I described in France where they made, remade a virus from five million years ago. If you read the last paragraph of the paper, they talk about the safety precautions and how they won't ship you the virus unless you pledge that you will only uh, do work on it under biosafety level three. So we've got really strong biosafety level frameworks at institutions. But what happens when it becomes easier and easier and easier and easier 
to do the engineering work and people do that themselves. So what's changed since the 70s? Well, we've got databases with sequence information. I showed you the phage sequence. We've got the internet. We've got DNA synthesis technology. We've got FedEx and D overnight shipping. Um, <laughs> And, and in the U.S. especially, and maybe we're just freaks, but uh, we did have an anthrax attack in the fall of 2001 on the Senate. Um, we have concern about people misapplying biotechnology. So if we go back to this website, let me show you uh, uh, one more thing. You could type in a different thing up here, and uh, you would find different DNA sequences. Uh, for example, uh, this. And if you went and got that DNA sequence, you would have the DNA sequence for a hemorrhagic fever, um, which is normally hard to get because you'd have to go to the next outbreak, risk death, collect the sample, right? But because I can get this sequence online and because they have DNA synthesizers, which can convert this information to material, right, all of a sudden the chain of control around some of the uh, dangerous human pathogens one might be concerned about uh, is, is, is circumvented. And again, if, if this is the world today and, and building this sequence of DNA would cost you about $20,000, in five years it'll, so that's about a Volkswagen, um, in, in five years it'll probably cost you about $2,000, right? And then it becomes cheaper still. Um, so that's the world that we're in now and heading towards. I'll skip over this. So I was wondering whether I should come talk about this stuff and, and the security issues I felt okay about because I had an odd experience, a good experience. I, I wrote a paper uh, with uh, the heads of a bunch of DNA synthesis companies and a bunch of folks from the FBI. Uh, and the purpose of this paper was to start a framework for screening all of the orders going into DNA synthesizers at companies so that the companies wouldn't unknowingly construct uh, human pathogens and give them out to people. And I'm sure somebody here could figure out how to circumvent it. And I hope that if you could figure that out, you would let us know. Um, last thing, uh, then, in terms of social issues, I won't cover them all. Come back to this project. This is 24 different genetic parts. If you look at how genetic parts are treated as objects today in, in the legal system, they're treated as patented objects. Three minutes. So here, for example, is a patent covering uses of green fluorescent protein. This is a protein that comes from a jellyfish, and when you put it into other organisms, bacteria or mice, they glow green. So you can think of this as a print statement, right, for reading out what's going on. So this is patented. Uh, here are engineered proteins that bind DNA. You could use this to turn things on and off, like if then. This is patented. And then here's amplifiers and latches and flip-flops. And what we see playing out right now uh, is, is that all the low-level functions in, in genetic engineering are being balkanized and, and owned by different people. And so you could imagine trying to write a piece of computer code where uh, if you had to write this program, you know, the person to your left owned the define and the person to your right owned if, and I owned uh, the left parentheses, you know, and so on. And every time you wanted to write a new code, you had to go get permission from each of these folks, and that wouldn't scale. Um, and so. This problem gets worse as we make bigger and bigger systems, and as the cost of, of making them uh, becomes cheaper because we can print the DNA from scratch and we go to VLSI genetics, if you will. And so right now we're here, and we're thinking about moving to copyright, but the lawyers are freaked out about using copyright because it seems to never go away, and I heard that the Egyptians were going to copyright the pyramids. Um, so if we mess up transitioning to copyright for genetic sequences, that could have big costs. Contracts leak, so nobody wants to use them. Public domain could be... Uh, uh, hacked around by people layering patents on top. We could do something new specific to genetic engineering, but the politics of that are very dangerous and expensive. Uh, so this is an area of active work. If you're interested in this specifically, there's a not-for-profit I'm part of called the Biobricks Foundation that's trying to figure out how to solve the legal hack. So last slide. Sui generis. Sui, sui generis. So uh, it's, I guess it's Latin. I won't remember it, but it means specific to the domain or something like that. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so the, the, the big examples in the U.S. would be ship hulls, right? So when people were doing competitive yacht racing, you know, you could protect the shape of your ship hull, and there was a special legal structure to protect ownership of ship hull shapes. The other good example is uh, mask works, which people here might be more familiar with. Uh, in integrated electronics design, you have the masks that are used in the fab process, and you can't make perfect photographic copies of those, if I remember correctly. So maybe we could do something, we could just declare that this is so new, we've got to do something new. 
Okay, so will there be biological hackers? I think there are. Uh, will there be a community of biological hackers? And, and, and implicit in this is a community that helps make sure or promotes the overwhelming constructive hacking of biology. And to make this more specific, you know, I, didn't, I don't know that I can do this. this is first, and I know like three people in the room here. Uh, you know, is the CCC a good organization for brokering a conversation about what the standards of community or practice would be around biohacking going forward? Right. You can see that we're not very good at it right now, but we're getting better very, very quickly. And so I think the time to have those conversations is started is today. Thanks very much, and happy to take questions for the time that's remaining. talking earlier about uh, re or shifting the parts of the uh, what was it, 29k uh, thing um, you did this uh, with a with a certain intention in mind but did you try it uh, randomly because uh, the lumberjack example that you gave they were working they were not working not as good as before but they were working did you try it randomly and see if they were still working yeah so when we redesigned the, the bacteriophage genome we did it in a very forward engineering, naive, deterministic sense. What if you just did it randomly, or what if you just evolved it, right? You could, you, could, you could set up an artificial evolution experiment in the lab to evolve the virus to do different things. We, we have done that, and when you do that, you can get evolved versions of the virus that are better than the natural isolate, but we don't know how they work, and we wouldn't know how to forward engineer that. So there's a lot, I mean, seriously, if you like reverse engineering, the best, I think the best set of reverse engineering problems in the world today is in genetics, because you have these reproducing machines that have been evolved for billions of years, nobody understands them. And if you can make any contribution to figuring them out, because you're a great reverse engineer, you'll be celebrated all the way to Stockholm, if that's what you care about, right? Uh, yeah, I very much liked your talk. Um, my experience is that I've, I was a reverse engineer um, using Xilog microprocessors in the 1980s, uh, um, shell scripts and C programs in the 1990s, and uh, uh, some Perl scripts uh, into the 2000s. Uh, but I've quit with that. Uh, I'm no longer programming. Programs, um, um, I've um, come to uh, resort to natural language and uh, to socializing and communicating and find that more e effective. And what I've been studying is uh, not so much the DNA, uh, I take that as given, um, but I'm studying the human psyche uh, and the emotional algorithms and what I, I try to figure out what makes sense, what are emotions good for, and what is informational medicine. And um, uh, I think I, I see a need that uh, we must disassemble the algorithms uh, of the, mo uh, um, the molecular algorithms that happen in the neuron and in the limbic system. Uh, that control, uh, that steer organisms uh, the size of a human being. Uh, and I don't think it's necessary to fully grasp the DNA workings for that. Um, yeah, that's just one, what I wanted to share. So I, I think those are some interesting comments. Um, obviously, understanding the human mind and how it works is one of the great scientific questions of our day. And it's interesting to imagine that we can make progress on that. There is. Um, I don't know very much about that, but I do know of work coming out of the Rockefeller that suggests that many aspects of human memory or behavior are under direct molecular control, and so that it might not be possible to do a full abstract decoupling of, of organismal behavior from the molecular level, but th that'd be interesting to see. Yeah. I was just wondering, so you, I think it's a, a pretty interesting prediction uh, to say uh, there's going to be sort of a, a hobbyist uh, community uh, building stuff. And I was just wondering, to what extent can you already say it's even possible to regulate 
what those people will be able to build? Can you, regu can you predict behavior of such a system based on the components you use? To which extent is that pre predictable? I don't, I don't even know how to begin predicting that. I, I think my, my, and I don't know if it'll happen or not. I mean, my starting thoughts sort of, you know, if I look at how I understand the personal computer to get going, that was pretty exciting. Uh, here we've got a technology uh, which is living, reproducing machines. Uh, it's a nanotechnology that works. Uh, so you could go hack silicon and software, and that's awesome. People should be doing this. But I think this technology is more powerful and more exciting and harder to predict, right? So, so I don't know exactly how that's going to play out. So just to, to give a basic example, uh, let's say you're, built, uh, you, you, you're allowed to build organisms that live but that don't reproduce. Yeah. Is that something that you can already do? Is that something that you can predict based on Yeah, so if you go sequence? back, that's a good question, right? So if you go back 30 years to the conversations where early genetic engineering and recombinant DNA technology got wrapped into biosafety, there were a lot of, there were a lot of discussions about how to cripple engineered organisms, basically, so that they couldn't replicate or could only survive in certain environments. Uh, this has been very useful from a safety perspective, but it's been extraordinarily controversial from an economic perspective, because when you now go and look at things like agriculture biotechnology, those same features which keep things from hopefully propagating out of control um, also for force a subscription economics model on farmers, because you have to keep going back and buying more, right? You can't just grow more. Um, so there, there are interesting trade-offs there. I, I guess the meta lesson, the simple one, would be you have to pay for control basically somehow, right? So it depends probably how much energy you want to invest in, in making the systems controllable that'll, that'll, that'll frame how predictable things are or not. But generally, as, as soon as you have a sequencer, you can build everything, and it's, and it's probably not feasible to regulate the uh, production of those sequences in a way that people won't be able to build arbitrary stuff. The synthesizers, yeah. We, we just put out a 200-page study on options for governance around DNA synthesis technology. We looked at everything from controlling the regulation of growth of sugar cane uh, to the distribution of the phosphoramidite bottles, those chemicals, to tracking who's placing orders and stuff like that. Not to recommend one or the other, but just to sort of say, if you look at the whole chain of technology, reagents, and knowledge, are there points of intervention that make sense? My personal conclusion from that experience is um, there aren't a lot. And it's much more important to have conversations like this so that we could frame the human community around the technology, um, because that's probably going to have a greater impact than any bit of screening software that's trying to infer the intent of somebody building a piece of DNA, right? So, I mean, the question to the CCC is, is there an opportunity to lead a conversation around how to promote a constructive hacker culture in biology and biotechnology is a real one. And if, and if I can, you know, get a response to that offline, I'd be really grateful. Hello. <clears throat> um, yeah, very nice talk. I don't know much about DNA uh, stuff before, and I was very surprised about this talk. But the most, the, 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 yeah, the thing I was surprised the most is was this machine. You call it the genetic synthesizer. Yeah. And 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 it, it. Uh, can, can I make a few words to this thing? Because it sounds to me like uh, it works like a printer. Or, uh, it's, it's really strange or it's not imaginable for, for me how, how it works. How much does it cost and how long does it take to, to, to make one, yeah, one gene? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, so the best DNA synthesizers in the world right now are operated by Agilent. And the technology they use is an inkjet printing technology. Right, to print the chemicals on different spots. And so basically the way it works is you're growing a polymer, you're growing a chain. Add an A, then a G, then a C, then a T, then a T, then a T, then an A, then a C, then a C. And the chemistry to add each of those letters is a four-step chemistry. Um, so you just sort of cycle through this four-step process every time you want to add a letter. So if you want to add, if you want to build something that's 20 bases long, that's 40, eight, 80 chemical reactions. The chemistry was really uh, well worked out in 1982, so it's 25 years old, and um, 
even though the chemistry is really old and really well worked out, you can see that it's hard to grow a polymer. If the chemistry was, I don't know, I was going to go onto eBay. You just type DNA synthesizer into eBay, you'll get the latest pricing. Um, the, you, could buy, you could build oligonucleotides off a synthesizer that'll cost you $4,000. Um, an oligonucleotide might be up to 100 units long, okay? And, and the reason you can't build more than that is every time you add a letter, the efficiency of adding a letter is 99%. It's really efficient chemistry. But then it, when you get out to 100, the overall efficiency of your process is 99% to the 100th power, which is like 30% yield. And so you just can't build longer than that. And then you have to figure out ways to stitch together bigger pieces from that. So it takes about four hours to build an oligonucleotide. Um, the best oligonucleotide synthesizers can make 50,000 oligos up to 200 units long with an error rate in one in 250. Um, so it's about a dollar a base pair basically to assemble a gene or a genome today. And it, it'll, it'll take you, if you were to order a gene online, it would take you about a month to get it back with a 50% reliability rate. Okay, and last thing, uh, is there just a USB version or can, it, can I plug Firewall too? No, sorry, sorry. So I would like to have a machine called the Stinkjet which is a desktop DNA synthesizer. It would, it would be, uh, I guess it would be Firewire. And what it would do is it would print 12 million base pairs of DNA a minute, double-stranded. Um, and that would let me have a yeast genome every minute coming off my DNA printer. The economics of the marketplace right now are not supporting distribution of the synthesizers. It's going towards centralization of factories. And it might be later that you get a, a, a sort of fan out of desktop synthesizers a decade from now. So, so the question is, how hard would it be to take an inkjet printer and make a DNA synthesizer from it? Um, I don't know. I mean, it would be hard for me, but uh, I, I know that I could build a DNA synthesizer from off-the-shelf components that wouldn't be based on inkjet for under 10,000 um, bucks. So, um, that's probably not very good, though, at that price. <laughs> So, so the inkjet stuff would be, would be a little bit trickier, I think, but I bet you could figure it out if you wanted to. Yeah, so the, the question is, will schematics for DNA synthesizers be made publicly available? Let me respond to that specifically, but also from a, from a, a bigger perspective as well. Um, I think that DNA synthesis is really important technology. Whether you like the Star Trek comparisons or not, you can make genetic material from scratch. So it just matters, right? Who controls that technology? Who owns it? Who has access to it, right? Because those are the people who are going to be building genetic programs. Um, there's very little public investment in DNA synthesis technology. Almost all of it is private. So Agilent has the inkjet technology. Um, you know, other companies have other DNA synthesis technology, and I'm involved in one company because it was the only path forward for me to get the stuff, right? Uh, so so I th it's, it's an important issue, and I guess you could reverse engineer a machine off of eBay, but I've not seen schematics. And as I mentioned in my talk, the documentation for the food replicator from Star Trek is better than the documentation for DNA synthesis. And I'm not, I don't think that's good. I really don't. I think it needs to be a publicly accessible technology. Um, I, uh, okay. um, I would want to say that uh, I think that both communities, computer science and uh, biology, are uh, somewhat mixed right now um, because there is some uh, bioinformatics group evolving right now. Um, perhaps at our university, it's quite a big community there. Um, so I would ask you if that would be a good combination for, for both communities. And another follow-up would be um, because most programming languages are based on a context-free grammar. 
I would like you, if there would be some, if there had been some uh, research into that, whether to um, decompose this, this uh, for baseline code uh, to, to a context-free grammar. So I think the interface of computer science and biology is rich, as you say. Uh, as a quick observation, most of those people are interested in science, not engineering. They're interested in discovering, not building. And so there's a bit that needs to be flipped. If you want to support the stuff I'm talking about here, you want to go make things. Um, let's talk offline about the language stuff. Okay. You know, I have, to, I have to think about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.